Hello, everybody. We are live for our final session of the day before the evening program, of course. We've got a fantastic lineup of women who are working in ocean conservation, and they're going to be focusing on gender equity. So please give them a huge round of applause. Ask, have your questions prepared. Online audience, make sure you throw in questions into our Slido. Please give them a big, warm reception to these ladies. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be back up here on the stage again. And um, this afternoon, or I guess it's almost evening now, um, to have this opportunity to talk to you about something quite different to what we were talking about this morning. Um, now, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mad Sinclair, and I am a tropical marine biologist, underwater photographer, and a conservation filmmaker. And um, today I'd like to speak to you alongside this incredible panel of women about gender equity uh, in marine science and the conservation space. So to give you a bit of a background, despite being shown to engage in more pro-environmental behaviors, women disproportionately suffer the impacts of disasters, severe weather events, and climate change. Yet here at COP, only 35% of the delegates are women. And despite the UK being one of eight delegations with the 50-50 gender balance, only two out of 12 people in the COP26 leadership team are women. Now, my experience in marine science has been interesting. As a woman, I have been ignored, harassed, and put down. And as a young woman, I have often been excluded from having a seat at the table. And across the world, each woman has a different story and a different experience. When I was 22, I set up a nonprofit organization called Women in Ocean Science, which today has expanded into a global online community of over 50,000 across social platforms and has represented women in the marine science and conservation workplace and learning environment since its inception in 2018. Now, our mission was to create a community to celebrate and empower women within the marine STEM workforce. And with such an, a large online following, we have committed to using our platform to raise awareness about the challenges that are faced by women within this industry. Now, traditionally in marine science and conservation and STEM in general, women have been completely underrepresented. The leaky pipeline of gender disparity at the highest levels of careers was highlighted by the Gender Equity and Ocean Sciences report, which was released in 2019, which showed that just a fraction of women graduating from university did not translate to later representation in the latter career stages. Women are less likely to receive funding from institutions for their research. They are less likely to be published authors. Women only represent 24 to 34% of all marine conservation journal papers, and of the highest ranked journals, including Nature, female voices only represent 22%. And the truth is, though women are gradually becoming better represented in the ocean science space, men still hold the lion's share of power. Now, this is perpetuated by power differentials, and this leaky pipeline of female representation decreases with seniority, and there is a culture of silence around things like sexual harassment, gender bias, and discrimination against women. Now, last year, as part of our work with Women in Ocean Science, we released a survey to quantify for the first time the prevalence of sexual harassment within the marine science and conservation industries, and what deterred women from reporting it. And we were not so shocked to find that 78% of women in this industry have experienced sexual harassment. Wandering hands, unpleasant comments, and the fear of retribution. Whether you've experienced it or not, sexual harassment in this subject is rife, and it is a widespread problem. But to this point, before this survey, the recognition of the matter had manifested largely through personal observation and anecdotal statements as incidents largely go unreported, confined to a whisper network amongst friends or peers for fear of damaging career traje trajectory or fear for reprisal from men. 
And whilst this is disappointing, but not wholly unexpected, to see in numbers for the first time how per pervasive this issue is for women in the marine science workplace and learning environments, what was more worrying to see is that women are deterred from reporting it due to systemic failures. One in two women would not feel comfortable reporting sexual harassment. Almost half of women didn't even know if their institution had a sexual harassment policy. And when we reached out to universities to ask them, nearly all of them didn't get back to us. From physical acts of sexual assault and rape to the tired, it's just a joke narrative that normalizes this kind of harassment. Our report highlighted just how important it is to ensure that we are creating safe spaces for all in marine science. And it's not only raised questions as to whether current reporting systems are effective or even in place at all, but to whether we are failing to diffuse the power dynamics that currently enable harassment to persist. Now, I'm speaking of sexual harassment specifically right now, but problems for women in this industry extend far beyond the realms of harassment. We're talking about gender pay gaps, imposter syndrome, lack of representation, lack of diversity, discrimination, lack of female role models, cultural barriers to entering the workforce, a lack of education, a lack of access. The problems are enumerate and the representation of female voices is minimal. Now, women should not be discouraged from pursuing a career in marine science, nor prompted to leave this field due to systemic failures. And with bias, discrimination and harassment cited as the leading drivers of underrepresentation, as we push for more women in science, we must also address these underlying issues. So today, I am thrilled to be joined by such a fantastic panel of not just women, but young women in the marine science sectors. And they're here to talk about their own their own experiences as women in this industry and to talk about why female voices are so important for nature and how we can tackle these gendered issues. I'd like everyone to start by giving our panel a round of applause because I'm so thrilled that they're here today. So um, I'd like everyone to start off by uh, introducing yourself. I think we'll go in linear order and start with Francesca. Tell us about, you know, not just your background, but your experience of being a woman in this industry. Oh, quite a question to start with. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Francesca Chopman. I'm the founder and managing director of an organization called Love the Oceans. We're a marine conservation organization working in Mozambique. Um, I have a bit of a different experience because, like you, I started my own organization. So... Um, straight, straight in, like just out of university. Um, so I had limited time within the actual workforce um, and created my own workforce, which is actually largely women um, dominated. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think um, my experience, I mean, I was sat with our community outreach manager the other day uh, talking about this in Mozambique, and I said, Do you think, because um, I had just got the news that we were doing this panel and I was discussing it with him. And I said, do you think that we would have achieved more as an organization if I was a man? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, really? Because sometimes I think that you're kind of blind to it because you get what you're given. And what you don't get, sometimes you don't know that you don't get it, so you're kind of ignorant of it. Um, but then I started thinking about it, and I thought about, yeah, a lot of the people that I've you know, been talked down to down to and um, from and yeah it's definitely been a rocky road um, but I think that's also part of the reason I'd imagine for you as well um, building your own organization and being able to empower other women um, to get involved in this industry and why panels like this are so important um, talking about these issues and hopefully everyone today will feel the same. Yeah, completely agree. And it is one of those things where I've definitely experienced that. You just kind of get used to sitting in that box that you've been put in and you think, could I have achieved more being a man or was this just how it always would be? And we do get very stuck in thinking that, no, no, I'm just, I'm just not reaching this goal, not because I'm not a man, but just because this is the way it is. So that's, again, as you've said, why it's really important to have panels like this so we can open up the discussion and share our experiences because... This is something that isn't talked about enough, and this is why we wanted to bring it to the stage. And leading on quite nicely from that is you and I have set up our own organizations, but Lilia, you are 
at the very beginning of your career in marine science and, yes. and we would love to hear from you about your experiences. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm, I'm Lilia and I'm a third year marine biology student at Harry Watt University. And uh, honestly, in terms of my experiences, I think what I've sort of noticed the most, and I like to observe these things, you know, especially when I see myself versus like a, a white man, you know, being a colored woman, I do, you know, pay attention to color as well. And um, one of, I've been given a few opportunities recently where I could directly um, sort of, what's the word, like compare myself to a white man in a very similar situation to myself. For example, when I'm speaking, um, I notice that you know I'm not being listened to, and people will rather you know have their own conversations. Whereas when a white man is speaking, he is always listened to. Everybody drops what they're doing, and I know that sounds like very, <laughs> very extreme or dramatic, but that's my experience. Um, Additionally, like being a marine biology student, somebody who's been interested in the marine sciences since I was like 13. Um, going on to like uh, social media and trying to like build myself up from there, I've noticed, you know, white men who are not interested in marine biology will get more credit, so to say, and nicer comments um, than, you know, somebody like me who is has a background in marine biology. And uh, uh, there, was a, there was a time I posted like a video about um, a somewhat contradictory, contradictory topic? Controversial? Controversial, <laughs> that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry. A very controversial topic apparently, which is pollution, I know. Um, why is it controversial? I don't know. Um, but apparently it is, and I got a lot of hate for it where people were coming for my womanness and telling me I was having a very woman moment, i.e. a dumbass moment. And um, then being able to compare that video that I had posted to somebody who had posted the exact same videos that, as I did. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, there, the sort of the comments that they had been getting were like, oh my goodness, that's so sad. And like, even though this person had zero background in marine biology, they were still being praised for this knowledge that they had given out because they were a white man. And so instantly there was this trust that, okay, this person knows exactly what they're talking about, even though, you know, I'm the one with the background and an interest and they had no previous interest or background. Like I had stalked them, trust me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically like not being listened to is something that, and not feeling like I have a voice, so to say, and feeling like I'm being put down and just told that I'm stupid um, is just something that I've, yeah, it's basically my experience. Yeah, and something that we really want to bring out of this panel is, is to bring solutions and to talk about how we can include more voices and make sure that women feel like they are being listened to as well. And I think that's something really important that we'll hope to get onto later. Um, now, Divya, as well, you have uh, an incredible initiative that you've created as well. We'd love to hear more about you and your background and your experience and, and uh, the uh, project that you've been helping with. Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Divya. I'm uh, an Arctic Angel with Global Choices, and it is a young women's network, actually an intergenerational network of women, uh, which focuses on young women activists from around the world who, have, who are advocating on the polar ice crisis. Um, and so to talk a little bit about my own journey. Um, at the age of 22, I was chosen as a young environmental champion from India to go on an expedition to Antarctica. And this was by a polar explorer and environmentalist, Robert Swan OBE. He's one of the top voices for environment. He's going to be here on the stage two days later from now. And um, so he chose me out of thousands of applications saying that, okay, I'm going to take a young woman from India, South India, to a place. And this woman has never seen ice before. And so I truly saw snow for the first time in my life in Antarctica. Wow. And I'm seeing <laughs> penguins and I'm seeing whales and I'm seeing like this, you know, seals and all these kind of, um, you know, the biodiversity and, you know, uh, everything about an ecosystem, which is truly incredible. Uh, and thus began my journey in the um, more of a polar and uh, sea ice conservation space. And I've been an advocate for the polar ice um, 
crisis since then. I've worked in the Arctic research as well. And um, so I've helped lead expeditions back to Antarctica. And in, through this entire process, it was all men. And also specifically, you know, I was the only kind of person of color most of the time. So it was incredibly lonely at some point. Uh, I started questioning like, where are the women? Where are the women? You know, they, they care about the environment as much. Where are they? What are they doing? Why, why are they not here? And, and, I, and I was being mentored by incredibly amazing men, no doubt. However, it got really lonely. And I seeked out, <laughs> in some way, a women's network. And that's when I was introduced and became a part of the Global Choices Arctic Angels Network, which currently consists of around 33 women from 20, 27 countries, um, ranging from India to Uganda to even Greenland, uh, which, which showcases that you know, women all around the world care about um, our planet and especially uh, our oceans and the polar regions, and specifically raising a awareness on the Arctic, which is uh, kind of melting faster than um, we imagined. Uh, the Arctic is warming at three degrees per year uh, as compared to the rest of the world, which is at 1.2 degree, I believe, right now. We're already at 1.2 and we're talking about like, you know, keeping it at 1.5. So, um, and you know, if, if we don't um, include 50% of the planet, which is women, um, you know, coming with strong voices to help protect the planet, then we are really missing out. And so I think it's uh, amazing that, you know, I get to now work with uh, women from Uganda and, um, you know, from everywhere else to really share our research, to share our knowledge and share um, really just hope for the planet um, through the, um, you know, sea ice crisis that we're trying to raise awareness for. Absolutely incredible. I mean, I cannot believe that the first time you got to see snow was in Antarctica. That is probably the most incredible story ever. And, you know, I really resonate with what you said about being lonely because for much of the beginning of my career as a woman, I felt incredibly lonely because there was such a lack of female role models. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And finally, our last panelist, Charlie, welcome. Tell us a little bit about you and your background and, and your experience in marine science. Can you hear me okay? You can no, hear me okay. No. God, there's always one. <laughs> it's normally always me. Um, so my name's Charlie Young. I'm a marine scientist, expedition leader, and presenter. And I currently work in the digital communications team at the wonderful Blue Ventures. Whoop, whoop, some other in the crowd. <laughs> Represent. <laughs> um, and my background is um, one of research. So I did conservation biology at university and then thought I wanted to take the academic route in life and so spent a good couple of years traveling the world, working at lots of different institutes around the world and had an amazing time. But one of the real things that I experienced was this imposter syndrome, this feeling of not belonging in this industry and continuously feeling inferior and, and specifically inferior to men. And there also being a lot of power dynamics um, being felt or felt many times like I was being exploited and that's something that I felt like I've experienced a lot and I think an issue that um, is a big problem and continues to this day especially in the marine conservation sector and especially in academia which historically science has been a white male dominated industry and, and even now as you mentioned in your opening speech there is a huge underrepresentation of women at these higher levels we've got a lot more women now coming through we've got quite a good balance when it comes to PhDs we've got lots of men and women doing that but as you mentioned this leaky pipeline where something's going wrong that all of these women that are starting out their careers in science are just not making it up into these other levels and I know we're going to dive into a couple of those in a moment. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, your, for sharing your experiences, Charlie. And over-exploitation, I mean, that's a massive one. Uh, I definitely felt at many times that I was working harder because I was a woman um, and that I was being taken advantage of because um, I didn't feel like I had the authority to say no, whereas my male counterparts that were of the same level and the same age would turn around and say no, whereas I didn't feel like I could. So before we get stuck into some of the questions that we've prepared uh, here for the session today, I also want to say that we actually want this to be more of an open session. So if you do have questions at kind of the end of each of our theme, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, invite our panelists to answer any of the questions that you have, because really 
this is quite a complex topic to talk about. I mean, we're not just going to cover female voices in uh, the marine science and conservation space, but also uh, the lack of diversity and the lack of representation. And these are very difficult and sometimes uncomfortable things for a lot of us to talk about because they make us question not only our own privilege and where we, we stand within our own field and our own work and our own lives, but it also makes us appreciate the experiences of those around us. So, before we dive in, uh, I think it's probably a good, I, a good time to uh, do a little bit of an explanation about what gender equity is. Um, so, Charlie, I, I know that you've got a very good analogy of this. Would you like to start off with a little bit of uh, scary audience participation? Everyone loves a bit of audience participation. It's a nice break for everyone. So, what I you know, want you to do is to all stand up safely. We've already had a, a couple of drinks over here be spilt. So I want everybody to stand up, and as Mads has explained, I'm going to now paint a picture of the difference between equality and equity. So essentially, equality is the end goal. That's where we want to get. But we have to consider equity. So all of you have stood up. Look around. Look at the person next to you. Actually, you're all generally quite similar heights, okay? But look, look for the tallest people in the room, okay? The tallest people. Now, these are the lucky ones, okay, because you've all gone to a football match, and the tall people can all see over a fence. Now, when it comes to trying to achieve equality, we all need to have equal opportunities. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you all a box. I'm going to treat you all equally and give you a box. So you can imagine standing on this box, okay? Everyone step on your box, all right? Can you see over this fence yet? Yeah. All the tallest people, they can see over the fence, but all of you shorter ones, I'm sorry, the disadvantaged ones here, you can't quite see over this fence yet. And this is where, <laughs> you can jump, jump if you want. And this is where equity comes in. So what equity is about is specifically looking at the needs of each individual, okay? So everyone has different needs, and not all of you are the same height. So you need support to be able to see over that fence, to, have, to achieve that equality, to be able to have that same opportunity, to see over the fence, to be able to watch this football match. So what you do is you look at these people, everyone looking in this room, so I'm going to pick out Becca here, okay? So now, Becca, I've singled you out as one of the shortest people in this room. <laughs> You can't quite see over that fence, all right? But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you two boxes. So stand on your chair. Can you now see over that fence? Fantastic. OK, so this is equitability. This is looking at Becca and saying, OK, so Becca is a bit shorter than some other people here. And so by giving her two boxes, she can now see over the fence. So this is essentially our path to equality, is by not just treating everybody equally, but also by looking at the specific needs of what people need to be able to achieve that. Now, ultimately, in an ideal world, when we reach equality, we can knock down that fence. So I just want everyone to go, boof, smash down that fence, right? So no matter how tall you are now, that fence is gone. Equality is essentially this goal, where all of you can see that match without needing two boxes or one box to be able to see over that. So this is the fundamental difference between equality and equity. And this is why we need equity to be able to achieve equality. Thanks, Charlie. You're all relieved from uh, participation. And just a disclaimer, Becca was brief beforehand. So <laughs> she did consent to being called the shortest on a live stream that I know is going to thousands of people. I am so, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so. Um, Let's get stuck into some questions, and um, I think, Divya, this is a good one for you. Let's talk about this connection that women have with nature, because women fundamentally feel, I think, quite a deep connection with the environment. We're very nurturing. But why do you think women are uh, connected with the environment? And, and in your, your experiences, how have you seen women around the world come together to connect with the environment? Sure. Um, so I've been uh, helping lead expeditions back to Antarctica and working in the Arctic and Antarctic space. And um, we see more and more women being interested in polar science and being, um, you know, advocates for the polar regions. Um, and what they bring to the table essentially is a more um, holistic perspective um, in the sense that uh, you know, we, we've always had all these, if you think about the polar explorers of the world or the sailors of the world, it's always, um, you know, been men. Um, and, and, and it has always been, um, you know, led by, uh, you know, an opportunity to explore, but also kind of exploit. 
And, and that's where women bring a difference. Um, they are going out there simply to explore and really look at giving back to that place. And I think that's a huge difference in attitude from men from centuries and what's been happening for centuries. And so as more and more women are going out there to explore nature and being able to bring back these stories of how, what they were able to do and what they're able to do back home, I truly believe that um, women are leading voices in a way that, you know, from young age to also, you know, like Dr. Sylvia Earle. Uh, we have explored everything in a way that's, that's never kind of um, hurt any kind of, um, you know, living being or any kind of place. And, and I think if we go back to the core, um, at, you know, the, at the feminine voice is that of nurturing. And if we can kind of uh, deep dive into that emotion and use that as a concept to preserve some of the areas, like, like for example, now we are talking about marine protected areas in the Antarctic. Uh, we had one MPA, marine protected area, that was created five years ago in um, the Antarctic Southern Ocean for the Ross Sea Ice. Um, and we are still waiting for new ones to happen. Uh, but I think the concept of that comes from where we can be peaceful and where we can be nurturing of these areas. And I think for that very reason, we need more women to come to the table and to be able to say that, you know, we can do more than exploit these regions, especially when it comes to preservation. So I think that's, that's really key. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. So it's interesting to hear, you know, that women have such a fundamental connection with nature and the way that we approach conservation. Because when, as we've said, you start to actually look at this industry as a whole, what we have is huge power differentials. And so we've briefly touched on the leaky pipeline. And now, what is this? Well, this report came out and it showed that when you have undergraduates in marine science and conservation, you have about 50-50 men and women. Then you go through to masters and you kind of see the same thing. Then you get to PhD, which is the next academic jump up and we start to lose a few women here. Then when you get from PhD to postdoc, we're going right down and then you get to the next step after that and then we're right down to 14% and then suddenly you're like, where have all the women gone? And then you have this really interesting phenomena that occurs where you literally have a lot of men in positions of power in the senior roles within academia and within conservation and not many women there. Now, Lilia, you're in your uh, third year at university yep. as an undergraduate student. Now, when I was an undergraduate student during my degree, when I was studying biosciences, uh, it was about 50-50 split. So m boys and girls, it, w it was, yeah, didn't really think much of it. But for me, the really interesting experience came when it came to my supervisors and all of my lecturers, lecturers. In the whole of my three years at Exeter, I think I had two female lecturers the whole time in all of my modules. And for me, this made it really difficult to have female role models uh, in academia and also feel like there were women who I could speak to about my career progression in a way that I, I wasn't intimidated by. What is your experience of power differentials at university at the moment? Do you feel that you have an equal split of male and female lecturers and people in positions of power? Yeah, so um, from a marine biology perspective, like obviously at the moment we have like a 50-50 split for human sciences and marine biology. But in the marine biology department, I've noticed that we pretty much only have male lecturers and for me, this has been sort of like a difficulty because I do often look for like that female role model that I can kind of like go up to and like speak to. And obviously I've tried, you know, um, talking to the male lecturers that we have and they're lovely. Um, but I've always sort of like looked for that role model um, in the marine sphere. And so I've kind of found myself having to look outside of university and finding people like you and Francesca actually did come to do a talk at our university, which is where I got the inspiration to like look outside of the university, to be honest, um, because I was like, oh my goodness, like they, you exist, like we exist. And like, I just, I just have to look in the right places. But for some reason, we don't have, okay, to be fair, we don't have a lot of marine biology lecturers in general, but the ones that we do have are predominantly male. Um, and the two main ones that I've had are both male. 
So, um, so yeah, I don't know what else you want me to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just very curious to hear because I, I was an undergraduate student a number of years ago yeah. now. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. But um, <coughs> it's interesting to hear that we are still seeing that kind of thing. And Hi. I guess the next question to come out of this, because the result of having such a power differential doesn't just mean that there are things like imposter syndrome, but when it does come to things like harassment, as a woman, if you ever, have ever been sexually harassed or harassed in any kind of way, especially if you were harassed by a man, which the statistics show, it's more likely that you are going to be harassed by a man as a woman, who do you talk to? Who is the person that you go and talk to about this? Because most universities don't have a designated harassment officer. Most marine conservation projects don't have a designated harassment or sexual harassment officer. So. Aside from the min more minor things like imposter syndrome, there are big, big topics that we're talking about when we have to think about power differentials and the consequences that they have. So I'd like to open this question up to the panel. How would you like to see power differentials being addressed? What can we do, not us specifically, but our organizations and institutions, whether they're academic or conservation organizations, how could we be doing better to stop there being a power differential? And this is a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I think uh, we were talking about this earlier at lunch, how few entrepreneurs are women as well. I think it's something like less than 20% of entrepreneurs are women. And then couple that with marine science. <laughs> There's very few <laughs> entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs in marine science. Um, so I know that I personally, I definitely feel a responsibility to um, create more opportunities for women uh, within our sphere, and I think you probably feel the same with that. Um, academically, I mean, I've been out of academia for a little while now, um, but I think it probably goes back to equity, really, and what Charlie was saying around equity versus um, equality and making sure that women have enough opportunities to overcome barriers that may stand in their way, whether that's cultural or or otherwise. Yeah, and let's talk about some of these barriers now. So we, we've, we've spoken about this leaky pipeline, but why are women dropping out? And that is the fundamental question that we have to ask because studies have shown that harassment and discrimination have caused women to drop out in this leaky pipeline. But then there are other things to think about. For example, pregnancy. Women have to carry a child for nine months and then they are expected generally to go on maternity leave. Now. In not all cases, but in a lot of cases, women will then be at a slight disadvantage because they've just taken a huge chunk of time off of work to go and have a child and perhaps raise it during their maternity leave and then come back to work and find that they are perhaps behind by whether it's nine months, whether it's a couple of months, whether it's a couple of years that they've decided to take. Um, we do have this delay where some women are then re-entering academia, sometimes not even re-entering at all, and are behind their male counterparts. Now, in terms of solutions, we do have solutions to this. For example, in Scandinavia, they have introduced paternity leave for men as well. And it's forced paternity leave, which means that both the women and the men have to take that break for however long, and they can choose to split up the parenting however they want. But it means that those breaks that previously were just you know, taken by women and that amount of time that the woman was traditionally taking out, that's now a shared responsibility. And that, again, as Charlie was saying about equity, it's not just giving the one box, it's giving the two boxes to the person that needs it rather than the one box. Did anyone, did you want to add on that, Charlie? Yeah, so I just wanted to add that I think that gender conditioning has a huge part to play in the barriers that women face. You know, from the moment that we're born, we're told that a girl does this and a boy does that and that there are very different roles and a lot of women are made to believe that the best thing that we'll ever do is grow up to have a husband, a family and a house um, and essentially this this causes barriers and you know historically when you look at science, science has been a very white male dominated industry and some refer to it as white male property and essentially you know, women trying to find a place in this world, it's difficult because uh, we're being told society is feeding us this idea that we don't belong in it. And this is, you know, going back to my own experience, this feeling of imposter syndrome. And I think, um, as Francesca mentioned, it's about having female role models, but also I think it's the role of men as well. And I'm looking at all of the men in this room as well. 
It's the role of men to acknowledge their privilege, to acknowledge that it is much easier for them to move forward and move into these higher positions in this industry. And they need to challenge gender bias when they see it. Because there's actually research out there that shows that quite often there's a lack of awareness that men don't actually acknowledge that there is gender bias. You know, I love to think that we live in a world where people realize that this is happening, but quite often, more than not, men don't acknowledge that gender bias exists and don't proactively do anything about it. And we can't, we can't fight it alone. If we're fighting it by ourselves, if it's just women doing all the work to try and solve this problem, it's like us knocking on a door that's never gonna open. We need men to stand up for us too and to help us in this fight. And it's about you guys in this room actively. If you see gender bias happening, please speak up about it. Because this is the only way that we're going to tackle it, is by doing it together. Um, I want to add a bit on that, yeah. And definitely what I believe uh, we need right now is more mentorship. And not just yeah. from women who have actually made it, but even the men. And I think if they cannot champion us, then we're not going to be able to kind of break those barriers and get there. So we really need men championing women and women championing women. And I think that's only possible through, you know, having these strong networks, like, you know, supporting more women entrepreneurs, creating those connections, and being able to say that, you know, even if you took a two-year break, you can come back to um, where you're at and really keep going. And I think having that assurance, right, like, th is it through in the form of, like, um, you know, paternity leave uh, and maternity leave, you know, like, benefits benefits and things like that, um, definitely there are lots of tools that can be provided. But more than anything else, if we have mentors who are able to kind of, you know, make you feel safe about taking that break, I think that's more, more important than anything else. It's not just about like the institutional uh, safety, but also having your supervisor or your mentor say that, hey, that's okay, but you ha you've got me, I've got your back. And I think that's really important. I've ha I was lucky enough to have ma uh, male mentors who kind of supported me and said, um, yeah, figure out what you wanna do and then let me know and then you, you can go about it. And, and now I'm a part of this women's network um, who have been there, done that, and they're able to kind of provide that guidance and support. So I also encourage young women to kind of seek out these women networks. Um, even back home, I'm part of also like a women's business network just because I want to be more in touch. And I think it came out of the whole COVID thing really, you know, because I was also feeling like, okay, I need to connect with more women, um, you know, back home in India because I'd moved back to India after a very long time just due to the pandemic. So I connected with more women and, and I came out so inspired learning about how they, um, you know, build their careers even after breaks. And, and this is across sectors, cross sectoral, but, um, I think the stories are very similar in the sense that they all had, you know, strong mentors who championed them throughout. And I just love to add to that. Um, just going back to the point about privilege as well, because I think, um, like I see often online when women talk about this kind of thing, a lot of men say, "Oh, you're attacking men," um, and and all of that kind of stuff. And um, I think it's important to point out this at this point that. Um, privilege in whatever shape or form that you have it opens doors that aren't open to other people right so if you've got privilege it's your own responsibility to keep those doors wedged open for people that don't have that same privilege um, so for example uh, where I work in Mozambique we take a lot of different students um, and they come out from loads of different countries all over the world and help out with our research work one of the first things that we do with them before they're allowed to properly interact with any of the community members we work with we do something called a privilege walk and a privilege walk is basically where we line everyone up on the beach and you have your hand on your next door neighbor's shoulder and a sentence is read. And that sentence is something that you haven't chosen in your lifetime. It's something that's completely unavoidable. So for instance, um, you can hold the hand of your um, sexual partner in public without facing scrutiny. And if you can, you, you take a step forward. Um, you've never seen your gender discriminated against or made fun of on TV. Take a step forward. And the poignant moment in it is when you leave the shoulder of the person next to you, because that person usually, you know them, you think you're equal. You, why wouldn't you, you know them well and you think of them as your friend? And often you don't really think of the privilege that you hold in comparison to your very close friends. Um, and. The point of that exercise, because usually what happens is you end up with the straight white males at the front of the group and women of color way, way, way back. Um, and the point is not to make 
people feel guilty for having privilege. Privilege is not a bad thing. It's how you use that privilege. And I think, well, we do a big debrief session, 45-minute debrief session after the exercise to make sure everyone's on the same page about why we do that exercise. And it's important that people realise that you can use your privilege to amplify the voices of those with less privilege and pass the mic. And I say amplify because every person has a voice, right? You're not giving a voice to the voiceless. There aren't any voiceless people. Everyone has a voice. It's about just amplifying other people's voices and giving them that platform to do so. So, yeah, there's no kind of, like, privilege shaming or anything like that. It's just making sure you use your privilege in the right way. Yeah, and, you know, privilege is a really interesting word, and it's been used a lot in the, in the last couple of years. And I think, for me personally, in the, in the last two years, with lockdown and the Black Lives Matter movement, I have been learning myself and educating and coming to acknowledge my own privilege. Um, and, you know, I am privileged that I am a woman that in this country was encouraged by her parents to study science. I was encouraged to go to university and I went and I did that and I got a degree and, you know, I was encouraged to then go on and pursue a career. But in many parts of the world, this isn't something that women are actively encouraged to do. And in some places, well, in, in still quite a few places, women are actually actively encouraged not to do any of these things. Um, and that is a whole nother level of privilege entirely, and it's a whole other problem. And when we talk about things like climate change, which do disproportionately affect women, and also in many of these countries where women are not actively encouraged to pursue science and to pursue careers in conservation, these are also some of the countries that will be disproportionately affected by climate change. So when we have events like this at COP, these voices, though the women are not voiceless, we are seeing a lack of representation from these voices at COP, from these women to, to speak about these issues. Now, did anyone want to talk about how can we, because this also is a very difficult question to ask, how can we overcome cultural barriers to ensure that women feel like they can pursue a career in science if they want to? <laughs> Um, you I can mean, both go, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was mostly going to talk about um, media representation and um, basically, like, women empowering themselves and empowering each other through this. Because, obviously, like, media representation is part of the problem, you know. Women um, in, the, in the marine sphere of things, they do exist, and, like, women of colour exist, um, yet there is, like, almost no representation and recognition of us. And um, so I think there needs to be more pressure on like media outlets to report on like um, women in the industry and in marine sciences and talk about us um, because we're not hard to come by, we're not hard to find. And yeah, the other point was, you know, women supporting each other. And, you know, I mean, you've done that with uh, women in ocean science and... <clears throat> uh, I think it's like really important to just, you know, empower each other and just platform each other and highlight each other's successes because other people, we can't always rely on other people to change, you know, society and the way that society is like sort of, um, this is the way society is. Um, so we're going to have to like make that change ourselves first um, so that other people can take inspiration from that and hopefully, you know, recognize us. What was that quote that we were talking about earlier? Um, step up, step up, reach back and keep pushing forward. Aye, that was it. <laughs> Divya, did you want to add on that as well? Yeah, I specifically wanted to kind of touch um, on the perspective of women from Global South, um, essentially where uh, women are kind of looked looked at as the homemaker or you know somebody um you know there's there's a lot of issues back home that i don't want to go into but in general like you know who drops out of school if there's a water crisis it's the woman it's sorry the young girl the young girl has young to girl. go fetch water right this is the case in india this is the case in pakistan this is the case in africa and 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 that's the narrative and so a woman um from a very young age is told that she needs to provide for her family and that she needs to look after things at home and and that she's really disconnected from the planet 
But I think, and especially at this COP26, we've all heard about climate education being the next big thing. So I'm really looking forward to a time when all of us women will be given climate education in schools and given the opportunity to understand that you know we are all connected. It's, a, it's one planet, one ecosystem, and we all have our part and role in protecting it. And if, if we can kind of you know, bring that narrative of, you know, how women can play that big role, and especially with the nurturing and feminine nature, um, you know, for the protection of our planet. Um, I really believe that we can get more women from the global south involved in the whole conservation moment. And that's what the world really needs right now. We need young women from all these um, countries in the global south to raise their voice and say that we, we bring with us so many skills, um, not just for STEM or not just for like, you know, marine science or like, um, you know, just looking at what we bring to the table in terms of values and principles that can help us really bring the climate crisis, the solutions that it needs. So I think that's what I'm very hopeful about, but I think the solution that I'm recommending is climate education in schools so that women feel involved, yeah. I wanna add to that and just really reiterate that it's so much about really understanding that the value women bring to these issues, having women involved in, you know, tackling the climate crisis, and I call it the power of women because we have a natural tendency and research proves it to that we care a lot more about environmental issues that we are more likely to to integrate sustainable practices into our lives um, women develop preventative measures at faster rates than men um, we have this like you say this nature in us and a value in us that is so beneficial to trying to build a more sustainable future for our planet and for ourselves. And excluding women from this is ultimately excluding half of the population and also excluding you know, an entire group of people that could bring so much good to our world. And I think it's really about understanding that you know, we have value to add to this, including us is of benefit to the entire planet. And I think that that couldn't, you know, needs to really be driven home. And, and it's difficult. You've got different cultures all around the world that have different ideas of what a woman's role is. But there really is true value in having and giving women a seat at the table. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Did you want to add something? Uh, that? Yeah, I Go wanted to it. add something to what Divya said, because when she mentioned education, I was like, yo, that, yeah, I totally <laughs> forgot to mention that. <laughs> because, you know, the education we get, you know, even like from primary school, it's, you know, mainly highlighting the work of white men and accrediting white men. And um, I find it, you know, interesting because it was a... African Muslim woman who started the first university and every university after that has been, it's in Fez, Morocco. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, every university out since then has been, you know, um, sort of inspired by this uh, university in Fez, um, started by Fatima. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's like, obviously women are intelligent, obviously women are present in like these <clears throat> spheres um, but like we're not getting recognition even from uh, you know even in the like sorry in curriculums in school curriculums and in you know this education yeah no I couldn't agree more I think representation in education is is really important and it's definitely a problem that doesn't just exist globally but also here in the UK and I'd also like to add that the the environmental curriculum here in the UK just isn't fantastic in general at you know all levels really um, but to kind of bring it back to what you said about the global south now Chess you do some very interesting work in Mozambique and your whole approach to conservation is a community-led initiative with this uh, indication that one day your organization could essentially pick up and leave um, and leave kind of no footprint behind, but have left the tools and the knowledge and the skills in that community to be stewards of their own marine environment and to be able to be the ones who are managing the resources and, and creating their own future. Um, you mentioned this morning in your talk about, about the work that you're doing with women in the local community and w with swimming lessons and tackling different social issues that basically are cultural barriers 
that um, inhibit them from being active participants in marine conservation. And I know that many of the audience members here this morning weren't actually here for that talk. So um, could you just tell us a little bit about, uh, it was a wonderful flow chart for anyone who missed it, please go back and watch the session this morning. It was the first one. It was about half nine that Chess came on. Uh, it was a wonderful flow chart. Please watch it. Even without a clicker, you did it very well. Um, but yeah, could you tell us a little bit about this? Love me a flowchart. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, the organisation that I run is a very holistic organisation. I know that word's been used a lot today, but um, it's an approach to conservation that needs to be used more and more going forward. Um, because people need to be involved in conservation work. Uh, people are usually, almost always, the cause of the environmental problems, so they need to be involved in the solution. So, especially when we're talking about women at least in our area, 53% of the population are women. So when you're looking at designing a conservation strategy, if we're talking from a purely scientific perspective, not social at all, we're just looking from a scientific perspective, to create an efficient um, and effective conservation strategy, you need to be involving all of your stakeholders. So if you ignored 53% of your stakeholders, it would just be an incredibly ineffective conservation strategy. You wouldn't be able to achieve your goals. So it literally makes no sense to <laughs> ignore women. So if you're going to create a successful conservation strategy, you need to be giving all of your stakeholders a seat at the table. So you need to look at why uh, there aren't any women involved in the marine space in our area. And when I say the marine space, yes, I mean marine conservation, but I also mean like fishing in our area and diving and things like that, ecotourism. Um, and there are no women involved in that sector in our area in Jangamo and Mozambique um, because no women can swim. And when you look at why women can't swim, it's because they are scared of the ocean. There's been a lot of drownings, um, but it's also because they don't have access to menstrual products that are compatible with swimming. Um, also, swimming is seen as a less essential skills, a skill uh, than the male counterparts. So women are just offered less opportunity to learn that skill. Um, and that's because traditionally uh, women's place in Jangama is uh, looking after house and farm. And um, that means that, I'm trying to remember the flow chart off the top of my head. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, women, women's place is typically looking after house and farm. And that's because they're, um, they leave education earlier because their male counterparts are more qualified. So they're, they're kind of allocated to look after the domestic chores which is literally keeping their family alive so incredibly important um, but they are leaving school early and they're leaving school early because um, premarital sex isn't taboo in our area but getting pregnant out of wedlock is and there's virtually no education around uh, menstrual health or sexual education in our area so kids are having sex really young um, and then getting pregnant very young and when you get pregnant you have to get married and when you get married you have to drop out of school so you're losing a massive portion of your education um, and you've got a massive lack of education around menstrual health you've got a massive lack of education around sexual health and, and um, contraception I mean there's a whole heap of other stuff like this is this is me summarizing the flowchart but the flowchart was actually extremely simplified from what the actual issues are because when you're talking about menstrual health with women in our area a lot of girls don't go to school when they're on their periods so you're talking one week a month that's 12 weeks a year they're not going to school three months of the year less education than their male counterparts and that's just before they get pregnant and girls are getting pregnant around the age of 14 in our area marriage at 15 dropping out of school. So most people leave school around the age of 14. You've got a 50% illiteracy rate in our area, 75% in women. So women are at a significant disadvantage to their male counterparts. And when you're looking at getting women into the marine space, there's obviously the whole education piece around literacy, which is one of the areas we work on. And then swimming is another key skill in getting people involved in the marine conservation space. But the way to do that, you need to break down all of those social issues and come back to the point of where things are kind of falling apart and that's menstrual health because that's the reason that girls aren't going to school as much that's one of the reasons that they're getting married young because they have no education around how menstrual health comes into play and in, like sexual reproduction and it's that having no way of managing their periods is why they're not swimming so there's all of these kind of issues lead back to this this one core root issue um, so we've just launched, actually, a couple of weeks ago, Edna Galumba, who manages our uh, Women's Health Project. She just launched that about two weeks ago. We're in the initial research stages around finding out what's the most desired menstrual products to help 
um, manage periods easier in the area and basically level the playing field and give women a, a chance, a fighting chance, at trying to at least um, become a little bit more equal um, and have a few more opportunities. And it's a, it's a long old path ahead and there's many, many, many obstacles that, that um, arise in situations like this. But it's why community work is so important because it's just constant consultation and um, yeah. I'm talking about these issues. Yeah, and I think that's a really brilliant kind of example to uh, not finish the session on, but to kind of welcome questions, because it does really go to show that gender equity in marine science is not just about women in general feeling like we have less of a platform than men, or we feel less in our careers than men, or we feel less welcome in the space or whatever. It also shows that there is a massive disparity between every single woman. Every woman has a different experience. Every woman starts on a different footing. Um, and really, as we go forward and we do tackle these big environmental issues like climate change, what we also need to be making sure is that we are creating social change as well. Um, so I would love to take this opportunity to, oh, that was such a quick hand up at the back there. Please, please address the panel. Thank you so much uh, for all the work that you do. And thank you for being on the panel today. Um, I had an observation earlier that it was a joy to be on an all-female panel. And I would just like to make an observation that today in this program, we've had at least two all-female panels, if not three. And every day we've had a, an all-female panel. One young world are incredible in this area, but there's one other person in this room who I'd like to do a massive shout out to. Extremes Head of Sustainability and Environment, Amber Nuttall. This is her vision and she's made it happen. Woo! Woo! I'm sorry that that wasn't a question. It was just an appropriate moment to give her a bit of applause. Thank you. No, I love that. And you know, it's something that I've noticed as well that yeah, as I said at the beginning in my opening, uh, there are not very many women leading the talks at COP in these positions of power. But one of the brilliant things to see, especially here, we've seen a lot of young voices represented and we've seen a lot of female voices represented. And, you know, the conversations that we've been having and the people we've got to meet, not just today, but throughout this event have been fantastic. So really, thank you so much for uh, putting this together because it has it has been brilliant. Um, it's our total pleasure at Extreme to have all of you here. Um, couldn't be more delighted. Um, I would just like this opportunity with, um, with all you fabulous ladies on the stage to say that I very much hope that the next COP president will be a woman, uh, an African woman. I think that would probably be one of the best things that could happen out of COP26. I am still praying, as I know everybody else in this room, is that there are going to be even better things to come out of COP26. But to take us to COP27, that would be a true joy to see. And thank you. Did you want to add something? No? Questions? Yes, let's, let's take one. Um, hi, so that was really great um, from all of you. That was really interesting. Um, I think one of my concerns is how can we ensure that non-binary people are also included in this conversation as we move forward? Obviously, like we're using the term gender equity, so I think that's something just to mention. Yeah, um, sorry. Can I? <laughs> Please take it, you, you go for it. So um, I literally just read an article the other day and you're absolutely right, like there is pretty much no data on you know gender minorities, like non-binary non people, sorry. Um, However, um, my friend just launched a Gillette Venus wa women, in, women Wave Makers project for LGBTQ plus women in STEM, um, which is basically a $3,000 um, scholarship uh, opportunity. And um, it's literally just opened up and like she's proper trying to advocate for LGBTQ plus women in STEM. So if you are concerned about that, I definitely redirect you to her. Um, I'm Deb, yeah, so visit her at www.mckenzie.com. Just, just to add to that as well, I think it's about awareness and it goes back to education and awareness and acceptance of these things and by talking about it, you know, talking about it and, and it becoming less of a taboo, um, I think that that's a huge, a huge part of it and this is also another huge part when it comes to all of the gender bias that we experience as women, um, you know, comes back to this lack of awareness again and so education and awareness I think is key to also tackling that.
Yeah, and again, sorry. Um, just like uplifting and highlighting the voices of gender minorities in this field because they exist and like they're not like hard to come by. So it's like we just need to keep highlighting these people and like highlighting the fact that they exist and like every, you know, we exist. <laughs> um, and then maybe this like subtle brainwashing that we've sort of. Um, endured over years and years will slowly fade away and like we'll come to see the world for what it really is which is diverse yeah and just to kind of add off the back of that well you know we've done a panel about women in ocean science today because that's uh you know that i couldn't speak for from the experiences from a non-binary person um because you know i would never feel comfortable speaking from someone else's experience but what i want to highlight is even though we have spoken about women today the fundamental like the bottom line that we're trying to say is that we want all voices to be heard equally and everyone to kind of start off on an even footing. And if they haven't started off on an even footing to have the opportunities, and you've just highlighted a, a great opportunity that, that does leverage the uh, playing field. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of what I have to, oh yeah, we'll come on, come on to that in a second as well. Um, we have some fantastic organizations to share with you all um, at the end of this presentation too. Um, but I know that you had some questions that, that have come through online. We have, um, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Malaysia and it's to all panelists. And the question is, what mental health challenges have you all faced in your work? And how, 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 have, you how have you overcome them slash overcoming them? Well, who would like to start this one? <laughs> Open Pandora's box there. <laughs> Um, okay, I will start. So, uh, oh, it's very difficult with these situations because this is one of those things where I'm speaking on a panel and there are a lot of people watching this and I don't want to go into too much detail about, you know, what's happened in my career, but I've been sexually harassed um, in my job more than once, uh, one time pretty badly. And um, on my mental health, how did that affect it? Well. I felt very alone in what I went through and I felt like I didn't have someone to speak to about it. Um, and it's, I don't know, I would never, I wouldn't say that I have uh, had mental, um, proper mental health condition, but it definitely affected the quality of my life and the way that, you know, I viewed my work and that I viewed my own standing within my work and amongst my colleagues. and. That was a really difficult time for me. And thankfully, I was surrounded by incredible women like the one we have on this panel today who did support me uh, at the time and um, helped get me through that. And this goes back to what we were saying about women uplifting each other. And there is a special bond that women form. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the mental health ex experience that, that I've had in this industry. I definitely feel that like when women it's like this thing in this industry because there's not many of you <laughs> when you go into a room and there's like one other woman there you kind of make a beeline for each other and it's just this unwritten 100%. agreement that you're going to be friends <laughs> it's kind of the support that you feel by having that role model um mental health things that i've kind of had to deal with i would say is bullying in academia um sometimes there's a really unrealistic <laughs> idea of uh you know, what you should be able to achieve. And I felt like I've had male um, academics in, in positions of power use bullying as a way to exploit me um, and use their sort of, their, their male power over me to to work me to, to my bone. And I've been in, you know, some horrible situations where I just have been working so hard. I remember specifically in my master's, working 24 seven, looking after 26 coral reef like tanks that I had, doing manual water changes day in, day out, in the lab all the time, and then being turned around to and, and sworn at and saying that I don't give a damn about the work that I'm doing um, because something wasn't going their, their way. And I think that this, this is a huge problem in academia and there's some real issues with power, uh, power dynamics that need to be addressed. And that's something that I specifically have experienced in my career. Um, and is one of the reasons why I moved away from academia because it was just such a toxic um, 
system where I think the values are wrong, where it's all about publications, bringing in money, um, and this just causes this toxic environment where it's like, we must publish, 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 and, and people get exploited because of it. And as a woman, um, I think you get even more so. Um, I think I mentioned a little bit about the loneliness when I spoke in the very beginning. I think it gets very lonely, of course, but one thing I really wanted to highlight, especially in my journey, is been eco-anxiety. And I don't know many men who feel eco-anxiety. It's just how it is. I know there are, there are, but like, we no, can't not speak many for them people. All. Yeah, there's, def speak. there's definitely some. Yeah, there's definitely some, but I have, that's why I said rarely. I've, I've, I've come across very few men who've spoken vocally about their eco-anxiety. Um, when I meet women especially, I think the way we speak with each other is always about like, oh my God, what can I do about it? And, and I think, um, you know, it, we take it more personally and we take it more emotionally. And, and, and I uh, think, um, I hope that you can also raise your voice about e eco-anxiety, especially how men feel it, because I think that's really important. So we don't feel lonely and we don't feel like, you know, we are the only ones, you know, worried about the future of the planet. And I think having that kind of, um, you know, voices for eco-anxiety is really important. And I know more and more people are talking about it. So the more we talk about it, I think we'll all feel a little less lonely. Hi. Oh, yeah. So should, should we, did you want to go or should we move on? Um, I, I could just, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you go. <laughs> well, well, you, you share your experience. This is what the panel's for and then we'll move on to another All question. Right. Yeah, so I was just going to bring up the... Uh, uh, imposter syndrome that Charlie kept bringing up earlier because that is something that I struggle with so much like to the extent that I will question every single thing that I say and hence why I've been stuttering so much on this panel because I'm like oh my goodness like I did, did I research this topic enough and it's like these are my experiences dude like calm down <laughs> um, and it's like it's definitely something I'm still dealing with um, but one thing that has definitely helped me a lot is just talking to other women and joining like these different like oceanic women's clubs and uh, different book clubs and like getting sort of a reality check in that everybody is on the same boat and everybody's going through the same stuff and we're all just here to support each other and like lovey-dovey stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's definitely something that's helped um, to some extent. Yeah, definitely forming a network of other women in the industry helps in magnitudes. I remember doing an event actually with you and I think Charlie was there as well. Were you there as well? I can't remember. Yeah. We did an online event and it was like all these different women and... Uh, it was for International Women in Science Was Day, it? Okay. Yeah. Ooh, whoops, should have yeah. known that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it was a lovely event and it was with these women that I admire so much and just I think they're the bee's knees and all kind of intimidated by them because they're just that amazing. And... Um, everyone on the call was like, oh yeah, I get imposter syndrome real bad. And I was like, what if these women are feeling it? That's crazy. Um, so it's kind of, it blows your mind how widespread it is, which is kind of depressing, but also reassuring at the same time that like you're not the only one that feels like you never belong. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I hope that's what you've all felt with us being very, you know, kind of candid and open on this panel today. Because as I said, these are difficult topics, not just for us to talk about, but for everyone to listen to. Um, I think we have time for one more question, so we'll go here. And then if anyone else has questions after, we will be around at the end to answer them. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, I think it has been extraordinary, you know, a lot of uh, things to, to think for us. Uh, you're right. I mean, we take, actually, situations for granted, you know, as men, we see that. So uh, over time, what I've seen is that it's not only to empower women, but also to socialize men. And it, I think you hear it there. So we are not aware of that at a certain point, okay? So when, when the challenge is there, then I, I see that you rely on numbers of women in a room to feel comfortable with it. And I think the, the, the issue here is um, basically feel safe, even if there's more men than women. Because in my team, we have four men and there are 32 women. So then I'm most, mostly Ooh. working with women, but I don't feel alone. I mean, I can work with 12 women and I feel, why? Because I feel that that space is given to me. You know what I mean? So I, I've been heard. So then if women respect it the way that I'm being heard, so we men have to do the same. And then you won't feel alone. 
even if you are with men in, in that case. So it's, it's basically not about numbers because companies are going you know, to level, okay, we have five women, five, five men, and then we work together. No, it's about the space. It's about how you feel you know, uh, you know, in, entitled, that you're being heard. And yeah, that's, that's basically what it is. And because we feel granted, we can go into harassment as well. You know what I mean? So then to, it, it needs to be boundaries, and we don't have it. You know? Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Right, I think uh, that is all we have time for today. I just want to say a thank you once again to everyone on the panel for coming and sharing because you're all amazing. Uh, I have a lot of love for all of you. Some of us just met today. but um, And it's been really brilliant to have everyone listen and ask these questions. And as I said, we will be around at the end to talk about this more. And um, just for a quick organization spotlight, there are some incredible organizations out there who are working to empower women from different backgrounds in marine science and conservation. Um, so my own organization, Women in Ocean Science, uh, we elevate the voices of women and non-binary people across the world working in different areas of marine conservation. Um, and then we have minorities in shark sciences. Shout out to them. They are doing incredible work. Um, Lilia, would you like to tell us a little bit more or Chess about Definitely them? Definitely Francesca Jess. should take this, yeah. <laughs> okay. Just quickly because um, we're running out of time. We're just about to partner with them, so we've just got an MOU in the works. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, Minorities in Shark Science, amazing organisation, um, giving platforms and voices and actually fellowships and scholarships yeah. to minorities within the space. So um, if you belong to a minority group, definitely look them up. They've got an amazing community as well that you can become part of too. Um, yeah. Uh, so I want to highlight, of course, uh, the Arctic Angels Network, uh, which is run by Global Choices. Um, and we are 33 women from 27 countries so far and growing. So if you are a young woman or man, in fact, we are, we are growing um, and creating an um, Arctic Sea Ice Task Force um, to raise voices for the urgency in the Arctic um, right now. So if you are interested, please do join us. We are Arctic Angels at Global Choices. And this doesn't just stick within the realms of science as well. We have uh, organizations like Girls at Scuba um, for people that aren't scientists but do also love the ocean that helps to include female voices together. And um, anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the events this evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. A phenomenal way to end an inspiring day. I think we ha we've had a packed room because I think Oceans hasn't gotten enough space here at COP. So thank you so much for taking the time to come. Come back tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. We'll be talking about forests all day. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>